All right, can we start? Okay, so your, your mid semester break is over. Right, back to second half. Now, uh, before we start, uh, your, your CCNA is on again. Huh? Right, I have, I, was, I have sent you all the new schedule for your, the remaining chapters, right? As usual, starting from Tuesday until the following Monday for each week. Have you received? Yes, okay. Right, so make sure you do it on, uh, on, on the allocated time, uh, allocated duration. All right, so let's, uh, let's do this chapter today. Now, this chapter is about network devices. Right, so we have seen earlier topologies, we have seen earlier uh, media access control, and how basically, uh, and also the transmission media. Now, now another co component of computer networks will be the devices itself, the equipment. Right, so here, we, what we're talking about, what kind of equipment are normally used in computer networks, right? For, the, for it to exchange, to, for it to facilitate data communication between one machine and another machine, right? So this is what the device is all about. So there are about, uh, about five or six common network devices or network equipment normally used in any computer network, right? Either it's a local area network or a wide area network or the internet. Normally, we will, we will come across this. Not all of them, but some of them, right? So we're going to take a look at one by one. Uh, the common ones, so that you will be familiar with what is what is, what is called, what is function, how does it work, and what is it, does it look, look like also a little bit, right? So and all these devices are basically also operate at different la different layers of the OSI model, right? So if we look at this diagram, we will see that they work at different layers. So for example, like repeater works at layer one, bridge works at layer two, router works at layer three, gateway works at layer seven of the OSI, and the passive hub normally is below that. Right, so they are, when they're working at different layer, it means that they have very, very specific responsibilities. They are independent from one another. Right, they do not interfere with one another because they're different, working at different levels. So we're going to start with the, with the first one, simple one first, the passive hub, right? Passive hub is the one here at the bottom. So what is passive hub? Well, in, 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 in simple terms, it's basically a connector. A connector which connects your computer to a cable, right? And we have seen different types of connectors. We have T connectors, we have RJ45, we have connectors for the five optic cables. All these are basically will come, will be, connect, will, will be considered as passive hub, right? What I mean by passive is that it does not do anything else, right? There's no processing, no interpreting, no interpreting, right? It just takes whatever electrical signal coming, it just pass it on, right? It's just like your, just like electrical socket, right? You have a socket, you connect your electrical equipment to the socket. What does your three-pin plug do? Nothing. It just connects the, the, the power supply from the wall into your equipment, that's all. Nothing else is done, all right? So that's what you mean by passive hub, right? So it's normally, it's basically all, all the connectors. So we consider this, consider this as part of media, part of the media cable itself. If you have a fiber optic cable, then you need fiber optic connectors. If you have a coaxial cable, you use coaxial cable connectors. If you have UTP, then you'll be UTP connectors, right? So this basically operates below layer one, right? We do not do, we do not touch the signals at all. We just connect the signals from one cable to another side. That's all. From one connector to the another connector, right? Simple. It's just like uh, your PA system, right? I'm speaking into the microphone. The PA system at the back takes my voice from the microphone, goes into a, a console 
And then what it does, it amplifies it and then outputs the signal onto the, mic onto the loudspeakers. So it repeats, it repeats the source signal. It's just not, it's just not uh, transmitting only, it, 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 it generates new signals from there, right? So what repeater will do, it will regenerate the original bit pattern so that the signal strength will be restored to its original strength, right? So this is what it does. So you have signals coming in, different types, different levels. Remember the signals as you travel along the cable, what happens? We saw that last time when the signals travel over a distance on the cable, its strength reduces. Right? We call it attenuation. The further it travels, the more the signal reduces its, its strength. After some time, after some distance travel, the signal strength will be so low that it cannot be, cannot be read anymore. That's the physical limit of the cable. And we saw that in uh, UTP cables, they're basically 100 meters. Say that your, your machine with your device cannot be more than 100 meters, because after that, the signal becomes too low to be recognized. We saw that for coaxial cable, there are two standards, 10 base 2 and 10 base 5, right? 10 base 2 was 185 meters, and the 10 base 5 was 500 meters, if you remember that. Right? That means that's the maximum it can go. Now what happens if you have your, your machine which is longer, further than that, further than, further than 185 meters or 500 meters, what do you do? Then we need a repeater. Right? So the repeater at the end will basically extra, get the signals, extract out the bits, and then reproduce the bits again into signals. Right? That's what it does here. Right? So Signals coming in with its reduced strength, once it go out from the repeater, it will be re restored to its original strength. Right? So signals like this coming in, after some time traveling on the cable, the signal strength will be reduced, but after outgoing from the repeater, the signal strength will be reduced, will be restored to its original strength. Right? So that's, that's what it does. So regenerates original bit patterns and refreshes signals with original strength. As I explained earlier, it also managed to extend the length of the, 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 length, the, the, the length segment now. As I said earlier, if you have a cable of, say, a uh, coaxial cable, maximum, maximum limit is 185 meters. If you have a machine which is further than, than that, then we can actually connect, extend the cable length by putting a repeater there. Something like this, right? So we have one, one LAN here. This is a, a this is a, a bus topology, a coaxial cable connecting here. So maximum is 500 meters or 185 meters. And then we want to connect with another, another segment. So if you connect these two together here, make it one long one, it will be over the limit, right? It, then it, then the signal strength will not be sufficient to go from one corner to the other corner. So after the rec recommended length, we need a repeater in between. So whatever signal is coming in from this side, it will be, the signals, signals will be read by the repeater, convert signals into bits. So the repeater will read the signals, convert into bits, and then generate the bits into signals again to be rebroadcast. All right, so that's where it produces fresh signals from the output. All right, so the signal quality will be maintained. All right, so this is how, it, how it, it extends the length of the segment. All right. So basically, repeater also can connect two segments of the same LAN, right, as just now described earlier, I described here. You have one LAN here, one LAN here. If the same type of LAN, meaning that this is a coaxial cable, this is a coaxial cable, same type of coaxial cable, and this is a 10 base 2 or 10 base 2, then we can connect it by a repeater. But they must be the same type. You cannot have, say, this is Ethernet, and then this is token ring, or some other network. No, it will, it will not work. They must be the same type. Okay? No filtering, right? Repeater does not do any process, does not do any, any interference with the signals. 
it just re reads the signals, extract out the bits, reproduce the, the fresh signals, right? So no filtering, every frame is forwarded. So come here again, this machine, the machines on this side is connecting, is transmitting data between one another, right? So when one, one transmit, everyone, all the signals will travel all over the path. So once you reach the repeater, repeater simply takes whatever comes, it will regenerate the fresh signal and then send it out here without question. It does not even look into it, right? Same thing, packets coming in, signals coming in from this side, you will repeat and, produce, and send it out on to the other side. And it's just like, like the PA system. It does not, it does not filter what I say. Right? It, does not, it does not filter out my mistakes or whatever it is. It just repeats whatever it says. Right? So no filtering. So it operates at, at OSI layer one. Right? So repeaters are normally used in, in bus topologies. Right? 10 base 5, 10 base 2. Right? Because the cable length is normally fixed, limited. So you can extend the cable length, then we need to find a repeater. Right? So what a repeater looks like? It looks something like this. Right? Like a device. One input, one output. That's all. Two ports. Right? right? One one this side, one this side. That's all it does. You can also have things like wireless Wi-Fi repeaters. Um, maybe you heard about, about this. Right? Because Wi-Fi also has certain limits in terms of distance, depending where your AP is. Right? In your school, for example, we have AP in level 3 onwards. So if you go move out from the building, go a little bit further to the road, maybe to the lake, maybe you cannot get a Wi-Fi signal. Right? Because the distance is too far away for the Wi-Fi signals. So there are devices called Wi-Fi repeaters. It will, again, it will, it will, it will uh, receive or pick out uh, Wi-Fi signals and then repeats the signals again, Wi-Fi signals again, into its original strength. Right? So that means you can be further away from the AP access point, and you can still get your Wi-Fi connection. Right? So same, same principle. Right? So that's what repeater does. So it works on layer one. Right? Layer one only deals with bits and signals. Right? Now, if we go back here, we call that either a repeater or active hub, right? So hub is another name for repeater. The only difference is that a hub is basically a multi-port repeater. Earlier we saw that the repeater only have two ports, right? Normally used for coaxial cables. Here, only two ports. Connect one, one LAN to another LAN. So if you have more lengths to connect together, then we, we, we have the so-called active hub or multi-port repeater. So in this case, similar things, but we have more ports now. It does the same job, All right? So it creates connections between stations in a star topology. So normally, a multi-port repeater or an active hub is normally used in a star topology, right? So each, each port will be connected to one machine. So what this means is that when this machine transmits, it, the signals will go to the hub. What the hub does? Hub is a repeater. It will re extract out the bits, regenerate the bits into new signals, and then send the new signals to all the ports, to all the machines connected to the, the ports of the hub itself. So it repeats to multiple outputs. Right? It's just like one PA system here, connects to multiple loudspeakers. One loudspeaker in this room, the other loudspeaker may be another room, another room, and so on. Right? It repeats to all multiple outputs. Otherwise, the job is the same. All right? They work at the same level, same, la same level also in layer one. Right? So repeaters or multi-port repeaters are basically the same things. So active hubs or multi-port repeaters are normally used as a hub in 10 base T, uh, star topology, Ethernet. Now the second one, the next one up, the bridge, right? The bridge does a little bit more extra work. Earlier, the repeater just repeats. Whatever it gets, it repeats the signals out to the other side, the output. No questions asked. Bridge 
will do something extra. Every packet comes in, it will look at the contents, look at the address, and then decide whether or not it should forward the packet. Right? The idea is something like this. You have, uh, let's say this, you have machines here, and then there's one, one connection here, right? So this is the bridge here. The bridge here will basically decide, asking, it's just like a policeman standing at the, or rather, okay, forgive a policeman. We have our, our guard at the USM gate, right? Anybody coming in, you will check, ask you to show your, your staff card or your metric card. If you have the metric card, it allows you to come in. If you don't have a metric card, you say no, stop, you go outside. Right? Or you come with a car, no USM sticker, you go back. So now that guard at the gate is basically a bridge. Right? Let me see, you're supposed to check something and then decide whether or not to let the packet go through. Or say packet dropped. If the guard is not do doing his duty, taking a rest, or just let the cars come in, then basically the guard is doing a job of a repeater. Right? You just say, you want to come in, you just take up your hand and say, hi, and then you go in. Right? So that's, then the guard is not doing any filtering. It's basically a repeater. Say, okay, you come in, go. You come in, go. No problem. Right? Yeah, as, as, as long as you wave at the guard, will do. With you. Wave and smile will do. Right? So the bridge is supposed to do check the, check the, so in this case, in a, in a network, the bridge will check the MAC address, right? You know the MAC address? The physical address of the machine, right? Then you will, make, you will make a decision to forward the packet or to drop a packet based on the address, right? So in this case, we, what we do is try to reduce the traffic on the network. And just like if the guard is doing his job, only allow USM cars to come inside the campus, then the campus will not have too many traffic, too much traffic in the campus. Right, the parking lots will be the more space for people to park the cars, and not outsiders to come in and park their cars. All right, so we should have reduced traffic if the guard is doing his job properly. All right, so how does it work? Like this, right? So a bridge will connect one network to another network. All right, then remember, if this is one LAN, then when this user this user is transmitting data to, a, to another user on the same site. The packets will be, tr will be transmitted all over the cable, and the packet will also reach the bridge. What the bridge will look is, it will look at the MAC address of the packet, the destination, and then decide whether to pass the packet to the other side or to drop it. If the packet is say, coming from this user, 41 to 42, Right? 41 is sending data to 42. The packet goes all over the, all over the cable, reaches the bridge. The bridge will look at it. 42. Where is machine 42? You will know the machine 42 is on this side. So no point of the bridge to forward this packet to the other side because 42 is not this side. Therefore, it will drop the packet there. Right? If there's no bridge, repeat less now, then this packet will also be received here. Right? There's too much traffic then. So the bridge now tries to cut the tra traffic only to packets which are relevant to that site. Right? If 41 wants to transmit data to 13, then again, the packet will be sent all over the cable. Once it reaches the bridge, the, the bridge will take a look and say, OK, packet uh, machine 13 is he knows the machine 13 is on this side, on the opposite side of the bridge, right? So then it will forward the packet to the other side. Then it will, it will, it will reach its destination. Right? So this is what a, what a bridge does. It's just like a bridge, the, the name comes from a bridge on a river. Right? A bridge on a river, there, there'll be a, a guard to check. Anybody, if you're living on the other side of the river, then you, you, can, you can cross. If you're not living on the other side of the bridge, you know business to cross. You shouldn't cross the, cross the bridge. So in order to do this, the bridge requires some kind of a table, a table which keeps addresses and ports. Right? So it will keep a table like this. It says MAC address 41 is, below, is, is, on the, is, is, on, 
is on the side, is in port one, connected to port one. Beach uh, pack uh, machine for number 42, connected to beach number, uh, to port number one. 12 and 13 are connected to port number two, right? So when uh, 41 sends data to 12, the machine, the bridge will look at into the, into this table and say, where is 12? 12 belongs to port number two, okay. Then it will take the packet and forward to port number two. Right? So it will need to refer to a table. So the table will keep the MAC addresses of all the machines connected to it, as well as which port they are connected to. All right? And the other thing is that this table, this table, no one, no configuration is required. It's automatically learned, right? Means that the, the bridge will automatically learn which port, which, which, which machine, which address is connected to which side of the port, right? How does it do that? Something like this, right? So initially, when you say we have, we have three lands together, we have three lands connected to a bridge, which is three ports, all right? A bridge, a bridge in the middle. In the beginning, the, 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 the table of the, of the bridge is empty, right? When you first start. Now, as the users start sending data, then the bridge will learn the, which port is the machine connected to based on the traffic which is coming in. Right? So here, A sends data to D, right? Here, A, A wants to send data to D. So A wants to send data to D, all right? So the packet from A will travel this particular land and then come to the bridge. Bridge will look at its it's table. Where is, where is uh, MAC address D? Where is user D now? Since the since the table is empty, the bridge cannot make a decision. It does not know why. Do not. So what it will do, it will just forward. It does not know whether D is connected to 3, whether 1, 3, or 2. So then it will just repeat, send, a, send a packet to port 3 and also port 2 to be safe, right? to be ensure. But now it knows that looking at the packet, it knows that it's coming from packet, coming from user A going to user D. User D does not know where it is. But since this packet is coming from, from port 1, it knows that user A is now connected to port 1. Right? Because it's coming from that side. So it will put the address A belongs to port 1. Right? Now, E sends data to A. Where is E? E sends data to A. Again, look through the port. So it comes, when E sends data, it will reach port 3. Right? So then, the bridge will, will put the E's address corresponding to port 3 in the table. But where is A? A is now port 1. So the packet coming from E will automatically forward to port 1 and then reach here. So port, this side will not get the data because it knows where A is. Right? And then if B sends data to C, same thing. C, no, no, no entry yet, so it does not know where C is, so you will forward to all of them. But it knows that B is coming, data from B is coming in from port 1, so B belongs to port 1. Right? So as more and more traffic gets, uh, uh, as more and more packet get uh, sent in, in the network, the, the bridge will automatically learn it. Right? And then we'll have a table which is more or less complete. After some time, it'll be okay. Right, so no configuration required. It learns by itself. Now, bridge operates at layer number two. Right, so it's called a layer two, layer two switch. Another name for bridge is a layer two, layer two switch. Why layer two? Because it needs to recognize the MAC address. Where is MAC address normally kept? In layer two. Right? The data link layer is normally where it keeps the MAC address. Layer 1 does not know how to read MAC address. Only layer 2 can read that. So therefore, it works at, at the layer 2. Right? So packets coming in, 
it will go through its convert the signals into bits and then pass on to layer two. Layer two is the one which you look at the MAC address in the content, then decide whether or not which port should I should the bridge forward this packet to or, or drop the packet altogether. Right? Now bridge can connect segments of different networks. Earlier we see the repeater only connects networks which are same, right? Only same type of networks can be connected by a repeater. Bridge allows you to connect sec networks which are different, right? So you can have one LAN. So this LAN, this LAN can be, LAN 1 can be one protocol, this LAN can be different protocol. So different topology, different system, this can be CSMACD, this can be token ring, or this can be a reservation, whatever it is, doesn't matter, right? A bridge is allow, allows you to connect different networks together, different LANs together. So if it does that, then it requires some, it must do some kind of network protocol conversion. Because different LANs means it has different packet frames. If Ethernet means it uses Ethernet frame. If you use a token ring, you will use a token ring frame. Right? The frames are different. The data packets will be different. So therefore, the bridge must do data conversion or packet conversion. Right? It does not change the MAC address in the frame. Right? And we call this a transparent bridge. Right? Because most of the time, the users do not know that it, it, it exists. It works in the background work efficiently to make sure that the traffic is reduced on the network. At the same time, it does not uh, stop users from connecting to one another. Right? So a bridge normally, it looks, again, it looks very, not much difference there, right? Just a number of ports and see how many they're connected to. Right? And this is the symbol we use for bridge. In your CCNA and all that, they use this symbol. right? to represent a bridge when you, draw, when you draw a network diagram. Okay? So we call it a learning bridge. Now, there's a, there's a, there could be a potential problem with bridges, right? Now imagine that we have two networks, look, look, look at this carefully, right? We have two LANs, LAN 1 and LAN 2. Both are connected by two bridges, right? Just like a river, there are, instead of one bridge, we have two bridges, or just like between Penang Island and the, and, uh, and the, and the Sabrang Prai, we have two bridges now. Oh, oh. Second bridge is supposed to open soon. Right, we have two bridges, right? The thing is that, what happens is that when A is, let's say A sends data to D, right? A only sends data to D, the data will travel all over the land, you will come to the bridge, you will come to port one of bridge one. The bridge one will know that D is on the other side. Right? Okay, sorry. Uh, earlier, the, the, the table of the bridge is empty. Right? So initially, the bridges, the, the, the table of the bridge is about both empty. So packet coming in from A going to D, it does not know where D is. So it will forward the packet to the other side of the bridge and then record as A, belong, A is connected to port 1, right? And then you forward the packet to the other side. The packet also goes to this side. This packet from A to D travel from here, go here, go here, and then travel here also and, uh, and until the end of the land. So this, the second bridge will also receive the same packet from A. It will also, since its, its mapping table is empty, it will also record the address of A in port 1, say that A be coming in, A is connected to port 1 of the bridge 2, okay, fine. Now we have two packets being forwarded, one for bridge 1, the other for bridge 1. So this packet coming in from the bridge 1, coming this way, will travel this way, will travel this way, and then we'll go, with this way, and then we'll go up again, right? Because the packets travel all over the net, all over the cable. So what happens is this, this packet now goes to here, right? Means that now the destination is D. So this bridge will 
where's destination D is not in the, in the table. So therefore, it needs to forward the packet to port 1. At the same time, it says, now A, user A is connected to where? It's coming in from port 2. So user A is actually on port 2. But earlier, I recorded it as port 1. So maybe it's a mistake or, or, or the user has changed place list. Right? So then it updates the table. It says A now is actually connected to port 2. So that is, the, that is this one, this, this, this packet coming in here. The packet coming in from this bridge, same thing also. It will go here, and then it will go up to bridge 1 also. So the same thing. The bridge 1 will also update its, its uh, address, a map mapping table, and say user A is connected to port 2. It will go up here. Now the packets are forward to, to port 1. It goes here. And then what happens? They go here, and then they come back again here. And repeat again. So now, A is coming in from port 1. So change again to port 1. So in other words, the mapping table fluctuates, alternates, right? changes uh, from coming from this port to that port, this port, the same, same address is being updated again and again. And there's no end to it. Why it happens? Because there's a loop. Right? Because there's two ways, there's multiple paths for them, the packet, to travel. Right? So this is a dangerous situation. So normally in a LAN, we do not have a loops. We try not to make loops in, the, in, a, in a LAN. Right? But in case there is, then the bridge must do something about it. Right? So this is called a loop problem. So to overcome this, then the bridges normally employ a special algorithm. It's called a spanning tree algorithm. So what it will do is that you will try to analyze and see whether there is a loop in the LAN. Right? So it tries to remove the loops in the topology. So in other words, it tries to make sure a LAN can only be reached from any other LAN through one path only. Right? How are you going to do that? Right? Just like this. You have you have two bridges, and then there are multiple paths connecting from LAN 1 to LAN 2. There are two alternatives, and they are in a loop. Now, the bridges are basically equipment. The bridges cannot go to this cable and say, I cut this cable here, or I, disconnect this, this, I cannot disconnect the cable here, I cannot dis disconnect the cable here. The bridge doesn't have a legs. Right? It, can, it cannot travel its own. On. So what the bridge will do, it will, be, it will it will try to, it cannot change the physical topology, but it will try to change the logical topology. So it will disable one or two ports on the one or two bridges. So some ports on some bridges will be disabled to make sure that the loop problem is solved. So there's no loop in the, in the, uh, in the bridge. Right? Just like you say, let's say we have two bridges connecting between Penang Island and the province of Pelestri, Sabrang Pride, right? Let's say you want to go from USM, you want to go to Bayan La Paz, right? You go to the first bridge. You go to Prai, and then you go to Batu Kawan. You come back on the other bridge, come back here again, right? And then you come back here again to Batu Ban, Glugo, and then go again. You go round, round. Nobody's stopping you, right? But in this case, we, can, we cannot stop people from going loops, right? It's okay. It's, if, if they, people want to go take multiple, take, uh, drive their car in, in loops, in, on bridges, fine. As long as they pay toll, it's fine. Right? They're happy with it. So, but in, in, land, in land, we cannot do that. Right? So how we do that is, so how the bridge will do that, it will try to send a special messages. So the bridges will exchange special messages, special packets among themselves, try to figure out whether or not there's a loop. Right? So we call it, a, it, will, it will exchange BPUs, like BPD, bridge PDUs. Right? So how does it do that? It's something like this. So let's say this is the main bridge. It will send a packet to all over. Right? So this packet will, and as the packet travels, it will record how many hops it has gone. Right? So when this packet goes from bridge 1 to bridge 2, it will say, OK, this is hop 1. I, and, and land one to reach land one is one hop, to reach land three is two hops, and then I can go on 
three hops, four hops, five hops, and so on. Right? Or another way, I can go here. To, go, to reach here, I can go one, two. Or I can go one, two. Or I can go one, two, three, four, five. Right? Anyway, send the packets all over. After that, compare the packets and find the packets which, is, which gives you the shortest route. All right? So since to go from, from here to go here, the shortest one is basically two hops away. One and two, or one and two, or one and two. Right? So what is, so, right? so in that case, so, and the same thing, this bridge will also do the same thing with others. At the end, they will agree among themselves, okay, now, this bridge will disconnect one of the ports connecting to LAN 3. And this bridge will disconnect these two links. Here, here. It will disconnect. Right? Disconnect, uh, not disconnect, disable the port for time being. So the bridges will automatically learn and then disable the ports so that to make sure that the loops are removed from the topology. Right? right something like this. Right, so, the, 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 so the, the few ports on bridge number three, port two and port three will be blocked, and on uh, bridge five, port one will, will be blocked right, for traffic. So if the, if the packet comes in here, it will not be forwarded to this, this, this particular port. Right? Packet coming into here, it will not be forwarded here. Right? So you basically put a stop sign there. So in this case, then we have we have removed the loops from the bridge, right, from the topology. Right, so the spanning tree we updated, so if there's a change in system, change in the network topology, change in the bridges, new bridges has been added or removed, then the spanning tree algorithm has to run again, right, to check for the loops again. Okay. For bridge connecting different lands, right, so to convert, uh, to connect different lands, you need to convert one network protocol to another one. So you need to consider the frame format, maximum data size, data rate, bit order, security encryption, and also some other, other network, network uh, criteria. Right, so all these things, basically the packet format has to be changed from one land to another land, right? And other things also. So there's a lot of work will be done if there is a conversion. Now the next one up is basically a switch, right? So a switch is basically a combination of a hub and a bridge, right? So we call this a we call this a layer two switch, right? Layer two switch, not two layer. That's wrong. It should be layer two switch. So what it does is that you have multiple ports. Remember the hub last time, right? We have hub here for the Right, active hub, multi-port repeater. What we need to do is that for every port, we put a bridge there. Then it becomes a switch. Right? So a, a bridge on every port of the switch. So now, when, when data is sent out on, on a port, it will check whether whether the user, you, so if you use a switch, uh, use a bridge on every port, means it will check the MAC address. So the switch will check the MAC address of the user and see which port that user belongs to. And then only send data to that particular port. Right? The earlier one, the, multi, the active hub, which is basically a multi-port repeater, it will repeat, the, repeat the, 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 the packet to all the ports. Right? So the switch will only send the packet to the port which the user is connected to, based on the MAC address. So it so reduces congestion on the LAN, faster performance. By do, in, to do that, it, it will have a frame, it will have a buffer to hold the, the packets in the switch first before they can be processed. Right? It, has, it uses cut-through cut -through technology, means that the, fo the frame is forwarded as soon as the MAC address is read. So you have a big data packet, you check the header, Look for the MAC address. The moment you see the MAC address, you know which, which, which port to forward to. You don't need to read the rest of the data anymore. All right? 
So switch operates at layer number two again, right? And it's very, very commonly used in dance, right? So we don't use normally, in, so like in, in our case, in our building also, we don't use repeaters, we don't use active hubs, we straight away use switches, right? Because it gives you the best. So switches already combined, already have bridge built into it for every port, right? So that's the advantage. Now, next level up is the router, right? <clears throat> Router's main job is that it, it connects your machine or it connects your LAN to the internet. So anytime your LAN you want, you want to connect to the internet, you require a router. A bridge is not enough, or switch is not enough. You need a router, right? So router is the one which connects to the internet. So the job of the router will be to find what is the best path for your packet to travel from your LAN to your destination, right, to the internet. Which path shall you take? That's the job of the router. So, th so in this case, you, you require some kind of table also. We call it a routing table. Now, this routing table is, must be configured manually by the system admin. Right? For the bridge, the table is automatically, automatically uh, filled in right, based on the traffic. Router, you can't do that. It has to be manually configured, right? And it also can be updated by itself by using routing protocols. So router works at layer three, right? So you have what routers here? I mean, different lens, whatever lens doesn't matter. There can be different lens, right? Different topologies and so on. And then the router will connect the lens together. And then this will be used to pass the traffic to the internet, right? How the router looks like? It looks something like this. So they all look alike. Right? Not much difference. So this is the symbol we use for routers. Right? We'll take a look at, at, the, at the, how, how the router works later on in, in a separate chapter altogether. Then we have the gateway, right, finally. Gateway actually is not a device. It's basically an application running. Right, to provide special services. Normally, it, it will work at layer seven, right, at the application layer. So what it does that, it, it does not work in packets anymore, it works as messages. Messages reach them, accepts them, read them, interpret them, and then forward them, right? The common example would be something like email gateway, right? All email coming in to your USM accounts, right? Everyone of us has an official USM account. All the emails coming in from outside will go through a special application called Email Gateway, somewhere in, in PPKT, right? So you will take a look at the, your email address and then decide which, which email server you should send the email to. If it belongs to computer science, it will come to our server. If it goes to communication, it will have its own address and so on, right? So the job of the Email Gateway is to distribute the emails, right? Internet proxy is another one, right? It's also a gateway. It's also a kind of application. Then firewall is also a gateway, right? Normally, all these are basically applications running at, at, at layer seven. So they can incorporate extra features, filtering, authentication, security, right? For example, there is a list of websites you cannot visit or you cannot open YouTube videos, for example, right? So who does the job? It will be the internet proxy, right? Proxy server will do that. The, the, the bridge or the switch or the router will not do that. It does not know that. It does not know how to do that. Only the gateway will be able to do that, right? Now let's take a quick look at uh, backbone networks. Now, backbone network is basically a network which connects multiple LANs together, right? You have multiple this LAN, this LAN, multiple LANs together. How do we connect them? We call them the backbone LAN. That's just like we have one LAN in this school, another LAN in another school. How we connect them together is a campus network. A campus network is a backbone network, right? So no station is normally directly connected to the backbone. 
right? They must be connected to the local LAN first. Local LAN will be connected to the backboard. There are three types, depending on topology, bus, star, or remote, right? So if it's a, if it's a bus backbone, meaning that the backbone itself uses a bus topology, right? And the, the LANs are connected to the backbone using a bus topology, right? So this LAN can be what, whatever topology, doesn't matter. And they connect to a bridge, and then they will connect to a, the, the backbone, right? Same thing. So one single cable running, this is a, back, uh, a, a bus backbone. There's no machine will not be directly connected to this backbone. No, they must go through a, a LAN. Right? Or we can have a, a star backbone. In this case, now different LANs are connected together by using a switch or a hub. Right? So this is, all this time becomes a, a star, star topology now. Again, no individual user will be connected directly to the, this switch. Only LANs will be connected to this switch. Right, we have switches in this particular building, right? Each, 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 each level, each floor will have a different switch for the labs, for the, for, the, for the office, for the students. And we have one main switch which connects all the switches together, right? That will be your backbone switch, like this, right? So we have lens here, one floor, one floor, and then the switches are connected together into a, muscle, into a main switch, right? That will become the backbone switch. And uh, sometimes when our lens are far away, right, for example, we have like our campuses, right? In, we, have, we have in Kelantan, Kuban Krian, we have in uh, Nibong Tabal, right? We have land there, we have land here. How do we connect the lens together? One way is to use a remote bridge. Right? We call it the remote lens. So we connect, we, our LAN here will be, will be connected to a bridge. The bridge, this will be a remote bridge, and we'll connect to another remote bridge the other side. So we use telecommunication facilities to connect these two bridges together. Either it could be a, this could be a lease line, it could be a fiber optic cable, right? Or it could be wireless, or it could be a satellite transmission, whatever it is, between the long distance. Right? So we require uh, basically a special device called a remote bridge right? for long distance communication. Finally, we take a look at virtual lens. Right? Now if you remember last time, we have a switch or we have a hub and then we have users and then we have users connected to the switch. Right? Normally, it means, it means that this is one LAN. All users connected to one switch or one hub is considered one LAN. Now, let's say if you, within, this, within the users, and we say, OK, we want some of them to, to, to become a separate LAN. We want one, two, three, three users to become separate group by itself, and this one, another group. Right, so how do we do that? One way is to physically remove them and then connect them together. I say, for your assignment, you choose your group, right? Three or four of you. And when you, when you choose your group, make sure you sit together, right? So physically, if, you, if, you're, if your member is somewhere there, you move and sit there. That's physically moving the users from one pod to another pod to make sure they're together. But if it's, a, if it's a virtual group, then you can sit here, your friend can sit there, it doesn't matter. You can sit anywhere you want, as, and we can recognize you as a virtual group. Right? So same thing will be a virtual LAN. Right? So in this case, if you want users to be connected to the same LAN, we need to physically connect them to the same port. Right? Here. All these, users, all these users belong to one group, so we need to connect them physically into one port. So then become user group. But if you, if you want to make this user join this group, what do you need to do? We disconnect from here, and then connect here it will be troublesome, right? So what a virtual LAN does is that it allows to do like this. So a user can be connected to any port, and we can create virtual LANs logically. So we say that these four users are one group. These three users are one group, and these three users are 
another group, or different virtual lands, although they all connect to the same switch. Right? So how it's done is that the, the switch must be a higher level, right? a, a switch which supports virtual lands. It will be controlled by software. Right? So we configure a switch, it says, user at this port, this port, this port, this port, this port, these four ports are considered as one group. Different users, and these three users and different ports are another group. Right? Or the users can also be in different switches. So we can say these three users from switch A and this user from switch B are considered to be one group, one virtual line. So what it means is that when this user wants, when, wants to send data to other groups, other members in the same group, the, the, its data will only be sent to its members, to be only sent to here, to here, and to here, not to the others. Although this user is connected to this switch, uh, other, other users are also connected to the here, but the data will not be broadcast to all. Right? So when one user wants to send data to its all group members, it will be the, the switch will know where are the other group members located, in which port, and in which switch. And it will only be forwarded to that particular port and that particular switch. Right? So this is what is being said here. Right? So LAN is configured by software, not physical wiring. So basically a logical LAN represents a work group, group membership defined by software. Any station can be logically moved to any other VLAN. Right? So it can be same switch or different switch, and as long as they are communicated. So the configuration of VLAN can be either manual, right, based on the MAC address or IP address and port number, or it can be based on some kind of a group or project name. Right? So as long as you belong to this particular group, then you automatically this MAC or IP address will be recognized. Or somewhere in between. Right? Semi-automatic. Right? And there is a standard, as ISO standard defined for virtual lens. So if you buy a switch, it says that it follows this standard, A02.1Q, that means it supports virtual lens. Right? So that means we can create virtual groups on the same switch. Right? Okay, that's it then. Right, so advantages, right, in terms of cost and time reduction, easier to migrate user from one group to another group, right? Users from different uh, users from different departments on the, working on the same project can broadcast messages among them without interfering with others. And also in terms of security, right? Users in the same group can actually broadcast messages and not others will receive it. So we don't have to do this thing all, all the time, switch user from one place to another place, we do it by software. Right? Okay? Right, that's it then. <laughs>